Hello, I am Sky Laurel Anderson at, uh, at the Department of Emerging Media at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I am talking to Mark Brown of Game Makers Toolkit, the very popular and influential, come to find out, uh, video design essay series on YouTube. Uh, I wanna give uh, you, Mark, a chance to introduce yourself and then I have some questions for you about this project that we, uh, that we got published together, even though you did the research yourself. So I want to also talk through that narrative a little bit. So uh, who are you? What do you do? Uh, hi. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Mark Brown. I run the YouTube channel Game Makers Toolkit, which is all about everything to do with game design. Um, and I've done things like game jams and stuff like that. But in recent years, I've had a strong focus on accessibility in games, looking at uh, how games can be made. Uh, more accessible to people with disabilities and the sort of options and features that the games can have to um, yeah improve them for those those for those audiences. Good. How, how long have you had that channel going? Uh, today it turns six years old. Game Maker still here. As of today. As of today, yeah. Oh, congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's that's fantastic. And uh, you have uh, did you did you say how many subscribers you currently have? I'm very close to having a million subscribers. So it's at oh, 900,000. Yeah. Well, what is that? The, the, like. Is that the gold YouTube button? Play button? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a big gold <laughs> button, yeah. Uh, completely off topic, but two things in your background I just got to point out, even though it's a waste of time. Uh, an OG Game Boy, which I also have in my office on my bookcase. Nice. I got it as a Christmas present from my wife. And a Blue Yeti microphone, which I'm currently using to talk to you, but it looks uh -huh. like you've upgraded. Yes, that was the like original microphone that started the channel, so it's there in pride of place. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's get started. Uh, sure. The project, the video you made, uh, a, uh, it was a video describing or summarizing the the accessible design features in major release games in 2019. Uh, what's your like three sentence or uh, summary of that video? If you were to summarize that video in a few sentences, uh, what did you talk about in that video? So I looked at features that are helpful for accessibility, such as um, subtitles, text size, controller remapping, visual clarity, colorblind features, everything that is sort of goes under the, the umbrella of accessibility in games that were released in 2019. So the, the 50 biggest games, looking for games that have done a really good job, games that maybe fell down a little bit, um, and just kind of getting a overall sense of the, um, the industry at this point. Now, it, your, the, your selection process for the video games was very interesting. You looked at sales data, which is very important. Not enough research and game studies uh, weights their results based on sales data, much less use, uses sales data to select the games. But you also included uh, critically acclaimed games through Metacritic and maybe one other source. Uh, open Critic as well. Open yeah. Critic. And then you also uh, added uh, some award winners, right? Yeah, I wanted to get like a nice spread of games that um, sort of hardcore gamers really love, but also games that are more broadly and, and generally liked. So things like uh, FIFA and stuff like that. So to try and get like the, the broader sense of these are the games that came out in 2019. Which was fantastic. When I originally watched your video, I was impressed about the scope because it really did capture uh, a snapshot of game design thinking for 2019, mm -hmm. which is one reason why I reached out to you to see if we could adapt it into an article, which for those watching who don't know, just came out in Games and Culture, which is a really baller journal. It is uh, a really, really solid game studies journal. Uh, I never asked you in my original email exchange I guess I could have done some more digging, but <laughs> why, why accessibility? What, what sparks your interest about accessibility? I feel like when I was watching your channel, it sort of came out of left field, uh, which is great because I, I study disability and accessibility in video games, but why? Well, what, what's interesting about it to you? Uh, uh, there's kind of two reasons. One was I did a video about um, controls in games and kind of uh, how do you get like complex depth uh, of, of just a simple sort of um, of buttons and things. And I had this offhand com uh, comment of like, maybe think about accessibility as well. You know, not everyone can hammer buttons and things like that, but realize that there's more to it than that. I can go in more depth with that and provide more help and, and details. The other thing is just people in my own life who have had, who, you know, are helped by accessibility options 
Myself, I have repetitive strain injury in my hand. So I find like button mashing just like really painful. So I really appreciate options to turn that stuff off. My partner has um, uh, something called vestibular neuronitis, which uh, she gets a lot of motion sickness with games. So she finds things like screen shake and um, options really useful. Um, and so, yeah, just seeing that like, hey, if you put in some pretty simple options in games, you can make them more comfortable or just playable to a wider range of people. That seems like a good uh, thing. You know, my, my channel is always about making games like better, uh, but also making them more approachable to as many people as possible while still sort of maintaining everything that makes games amazing. And I feel like accessibility, accessibility options are like perfect for that because they don't change the game for, you know, the vast majority of people, but the people who need them get a completely different experience. And that's just like amazing. Right. And, and so, so often in, in games culture, which is sort of plagued by these toxic masculine ideas of gatekeeping yeah, of a, a hardcore experience, it, it is a different way of thinking. And I'm very pleased to see major game companies uh, jumping on board with including mm -hmm. more accessible design features. And I think this is a good opportunity for me to jump in and explain the difference between accessibility, which is what we're talking about, and disability accommodation, which is a, a separate thing. Disability accommodation is trying to give an equal and equitable experience uh, uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, but accessibility is this thing that sort of just benefits everyone, people with disabilities, people without disabilities. I, I think it was very interesting that I think you talked about in your video how uh, Ubisoft tracked how many people were using their games with subtitles. Mm. And it was like a tremendous number, right? It was like in the 90%. Yeah, race. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I asked my classes, how many of you watch Netflix or Amazon or whatever with subtitles on and nearly every hand goes up. So that is the curb cut effect, uh, yeah. curb cuts with sidewalks, like everyone benefits from accessible design. So I think honestly, your, your series on accessibility, not just your 2019 summary video, but your other videos on accessibility are really benefiting games culture, because if designers are learning about how it's benefiting everyone, they're more likely to include them in their games. Yeah, uh, there's things like how a lot of um, game designers build their games looking at a screen on their desk and don't necessarily think about it being on a TV across the room and now the text size is like impossible to read and just like an accessibility option for changing text size is useful for everyone as they found in games like Death Stranding which had like you know tiny text and God of War the year before just like really small text. It's just a, one of those things. I know I, I definitely have had that experience. I used to uh, have my TV above my computer monitor and sometimes I'd throw the game on there and go to the couch and it was just not playable. Like not just the mm. text, but nothing in the game was mm. playable. I couldn't see or read anything, which was which surprised me. Uh, in your original video and then subsequently in the article that we published, we describe certain features that are like the, it's the golden standard. Like these things uh, help a tremendous number of people these design features or options are appearing more and more in games. Uh, th these are the design features we should be paying attention to when we're thinking about accessible design. Uh, should we start with subtitles? Like what makes good subtitles? And then from there, I, I would love to hear what are the other like gold standard uh, design features that we should expect from major releases? Yeah, so subtitles definitely very important, especially you know if games with lots of voice in them. Um, most important thing is just that they are very readable so it's about the size of them the contrast against the background and ideally like in the gold standard is to have the speaker's name against the subtitles so people know exactly who's talking and also there's a thing of like how much of the game is covered by subtitles most games will do the story sort of the main cutscenes, but then you might have like random bits of dialogue in the world that have no subtitles and so just trying to catch as much as possible um, and then sort of similar to that is tech size and things, the UI, um, yeah, in strategy games or games with lots of reading in them, you want to have nice big text for people who can, yeah, like we said, just people who across the room, but also people with visual acuity um, disabilities. Uh, the third one is uh, controller remapping, is it? a hugely important one. You can, like, if people have the ability to put the buttons where they find them most comfortable, you know, you can have a huge number of extra people can then play the game. Um, and then sort of like uh, the sort of subset of that is things like um, hitting buttons a lot or having to hold down buttons for long periods of times. You can do lots of things with like toggles or um, just being able to like skip those uh, 
button mashing things, which <laughs> I don't think anyone actually really likes. No one enjoys those. Come on. <laughs> no, no, I was playing a way out with a friend yesterday and a way, I don't know if you've played a way out, hmm, but that game is just full of like every, every time you do like a combat thing, you're always just pressing the button and our, our hand, we don't have any physical disabilities with our hands or dexterity, but our arms were just getting exhausted. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, I can't remember what the fourth one is. It is, is there's uh, I mean, so colorblindness is, is really important just because so many people have colorblindness, it turns out, and especially you know, uh, it's much more prevalent in men and gaming and just yeah, it does have a bit of a male um, uh, shift. Uh, so yeah, like anytime you have indicators in the world that are red on a green background, then there's going to be a whole bunch of people who can't see that. So I think to improve that, whether that's having the ability to change the palette or just provide more contrast between different elements. Um, and then the sort of the, the other one, I guess, is um, the, the difficulty or complexity of the game, being able to change that. So it might just be something as simple as a, an easy mode or, uh, you know, it's playing um, like Forza Horizon 4, where you can choose whether you want to have a car that you're having full control over, or do you want one where, you know, it does the gear shifting for you and it has assisted brakes and assisted steering and, and things like that. So the ability to just, just decide how, how much complexity and how much you want to be thinking about, because like, if a game is a bit easier, it gives you that more kind of uh, leniency to make more mistakes or whatever it is. So there's just sort of, it's kind of like a, a one size fits all of just gives people just a bit, a bit more of a, a chance. Right, like with uh, so you bring up Celeste, I think maybe in your video about uh, that. That is really a gold standard. You can adjust the game speed, which is super valuable for not only players of differing ages, but also people with uh, uh, different cognitive disabilities. Yeah, and, and Celeste was one of the games that really opened my eyes to how accessibility can be done in a really good way, which is that they really communicate exactly what these features are for. They're like. This is not an easy mode. It's not for the majority. Like we want you to play the game, uh, you know, without these on. That that is the game we made. But if you can't, then these are the options. Go go wild. Do what you want. And it sort of uh, doesn't confuse what the real game is, as if it were, as it were, um, and just but gives the people who need those features full use to just completely change the game to how it works for them. Excellent. Now to get the other. Uh thoughts about uh, the gold standard for accessible design features, we can point people to the actual article or your, your video or your video series. Uh, your video series was called uh, Designing for Disability. We borrowed that title for the article that was published in Games and Culture. Uh, but uh, if people have questions for you or wanna reach out, especially my academic friends who will be watching this, uh, how can they contact you, Mark? Uh, they can email me on uh, mcbacon at gmail.com, which is a weird email address, <laughs> um, or DM me on Twitter, which is uh, at GameMakersTK. Um, leave comments on the videos, where, wherever you can find me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for giving uh, us some of your time uh, no this worries. morning for us, this afternoon for you. And uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Thanks for having me.